Good evening. Shubh Sandhya. <laughs> How's everybody doing? Yes, good. Ah, starting to see a lot of smiles around here. That's what I like. Like day three, day four. It's always good. To do a little recap, we, uh, we went through uh, quite a few topics since the beginning. Uh, we covered the uh, basis of the, this meditation, where it comes from in the suttas, and then we saw where it led, uh, basically the garden, the, the first jhana, and then yesterday I expounded a little bit more about uh, bhavana, wholesome mental development, the awakening of the bodhisattva, basically, or part of it. It's, it's quite a lengthy topic, but... <laughs> um, and then I touched upon the four uh, jhanas yesterday, so it kind of unpacked a little bit more uh, about this beautiful garden of meditation inside. And uh, the four jhanas uh, are known as also uh, in, in the Eightfold Path. Um, can anybody answer me? Uh, where do we find the four jhanas? Under which branch of the path. Maybe I'll turn to Venerable. Yes. Yes. <laughs> samadhi, yes. Wise Samadhi. So there is a right, right Samadhi, right collectedness, wise collectedness. So the Buddha would say, what is, what is wise collectedness? And he would say the four jhanas, basically. This is what that means. And so tonight, um, basically we've, we've been covering quite a bit of uh, the beginning of the path up to the jhanas, and now uh, I think it's interesting. Welcome, <laughs> you people. Very good. And I think it's interesting to uh, now take this uh, understanding now we know a little bit more what collectedness is, what the jhanas are, and this is called samadhi, but this is also called samatha or shamatha. Probably some of you have, are familiar with these terms. And uh, what usually comes with shamatha? Vipassana, vipassana. Yes, very good. And so I like to see it a little bit like. Uh, when we build a house, or you build a monastery, or build whatever you want, buildings, uh, you need the tools and you need to build the, the actual structures, but you also need a blueprint. <laughs> you also need a plan, because otherwise um, the result is not guaranteed to be very, very good. So Vipassana is a bit, is a bit like that, and tonight, tonight's talk will be we'll be kind of unraveling a little bit more the blueprint of the mind. How does the mind work? And this is a process that is usually called paticca samuppada, uh, dependent origination. We're not going to go uh, a full-on uh, dive into the whole dependent origination, but we will take a first dip into so what are these hindrances that arise in our mind? What are these distractions and where do they come from uh, and how to deal with them? So what's, what's this whole process all about? I guess I wanted to share uh, a little story of mine which, uh, which happened to me, I don't know, maybe 12 years ago when I was, um, uh, I studied to be an adventure, adventure guide, basically. <laughs> So guiding people in the mountains, climbing. I was a rock and ice climber for quite a while. My dad was a rock climber and I, he brought me rock climbing since I was four years old. Uh, and uh, I, so this is what I studied and uh, long uh, canoe expeditions, like self-sufficient canoe expeditions, would like uh, go for a really long time. And I studied this for like three years and then uh, did, a, did a lot of that. Uh, and uh, at one point, my, some of my friends, I was living in a cottage uh, near Quebec City and uh, in the forest, and they came by and uh, we 
kind of put together this plan to uh, paddle down a really a really intense section of uh, a, a river that we knew it was like a, a canyon basically and then we just uh, decided at some point in the summer we just gathered and then decided that uh, this was the day and this was a very rainy summer and uh, the rivers were very 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 high and so there was a lot of current going down there was like uh, 250 uh, cubic meters per second so that's a lot of water for those who kind of can picture that um, and um, my friend was a raft guide on this river and he said that it was like the highest he'd ever seen this river uh, in the past so smart as we were we just decided like this looked like a great time for an adventure and so we just uh, I was the only one in an open canoe and they were all in uh, sealed kayaks so they had a definite advantage on me <laughs> um, as you probably understand, open canoes take in water, kayaks don't, so... <laughs> uh, yeah, very, uh, very intimidating first section, uh, but we still kind of made it through and uh, I got uh, tumbled around quite a bit and uh, just before the big section that we were supposed to kind of go down, there was like a, the last exit, it's like a, the kind of a breaking point, okay, so are we doing it or not? And um, we decided to go for it and uh, it didn't really take me very long um, <laughs> I just basically uh, just before even the canyon before even getting to that section I completely flipped upside down and uh, was washed away from my canoe and uh, started swimming <laughs> and there's no way that you, like there's no man tower can like uh, swim against 250 cubic meters per second of water so I was just basically pushed down that section uh, swimming and I missed the last eddy where I could have gone out basically my my, my buddy who was in his kayak was waiting for me in there and uh, he just <laughs> he just saw my desperate eyes <laughs> just like trying to get in the eddy but no, <laughs> not gonna happen. And so, um, and there's like a, this like, you know, fancy move that you can do to kind of like turn, or, turn over and then catch the, the counter current. And I did try to do that, but no, I, there was no, not a chance. And so I just got washed in and this was like all basically class four rapids. So that's like um, class five is the last thing that you can like paddle down. Uh, class six is basically unpaddleable. Uh, that's the, like the, the, the rate. And uh, class four is usually like a waterfall size kind of uh, higher than the ceiling drops and things like that. So um, the first uh, the first rapid was called the washing machine <laughs> and so I basically I turned around and I noticed okay this is happening and then whoop, <laughs> and fell into this massive um, this massive rapid and from there on I, I, I took my last breath and then went under and everything went really black um, I was just hoping that I wouldn't get recycled in because that's what happens in waterfalls is that if you float too much, you recycle basically. Like canoes can get stuck for like hours or days in, in this uh, current. And fortunately enough, I was, uh, I was heavy enough to go down and hit the, the bottom vein and be flushed out. But at that point, I didn't come out for a very long time uh, uh, because of the, the current and the power of, it, of the river. And I don't know if any of you have been underwater for a really long time, but uh, <laughs> after a while you start wondering, okay, so, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so when's going to be the last breath of air? <laughs> because, um, yeah, it's a really interesting uh, sensation. So basically, the first time I went under and I was like, okay, like being cartwheeling and being tossed around like a rag doll basically because it was so powerful and I was just there's no way I could you know control any of this like my 
arms were flailing, my legs were flailing. I was just hoping not to hit any rocks, basically. And, and then I, you know, as, as you go through this process of just realizing how powerful this is, so much more powerful than you are, the lacking of air and um, just the sheer intenseness of the experience uh, not knowing and it's really like it was really deep it was really pitch black there was like no kind of uh, it wasn't like at the surface of it so I, I thought like okay like I, I can be here for a long time and so a lot of things go through your, your mind and then I realized because of lacking air even thinking became you know uh, something obviously moving my body trying to swim was just you know, a, just a, a pure waste of my energy, and which means that I, I would need more air, basically, so, which I didn't have. <laughs> so, um, and then letting go, like, I don't have a choice, basically, like, this is it, this is what's happening, and if I try to fight it, I'm actually going to lose time, uh, lose air, basically. And then it got a little bit lighter, and then I felt like kind of rising up a little bit and I thought, oh, maybe this is a good time. And then I, I kind of started swimming and poked my head through and just had enough time to breathe a mix of water and air and uh, turn around to see another waterfall. <laughs> and so, um, okay, so that, that was what was going on. So I went for my second dip <laughs> and it was uh, very similar to the first one. <laughs> very intense, got really tossed around and again hope not to hit any rocks and at that point to be honest I was already pretty much like a, really close to give up uh, like in the first dip because I was like out of breath and the second one was just okay like this is getting really serious like I'm like I really might not come out of this and um, Of course, at that point, uh, from the first dip, I already had barely enough uh, air to keep going and uh, moving my body was just not even an option and uh, strength was kind of, kind of running out from me. Uh, and also, I noticed mental activity as well, like thinking was just way, way, way too much. Uh, it was even taking my air supply, which was very precious at that point time uh, any like every second feels like 10-15 uh, minutes for sure and um, so but at that point there was this complete complete let go and there was this river just washing me through and there was nothing that I could hold on to there was nothing uh, pulling me anywhere and it was a complete letting go of everything basically and at that time because at the beginning uh, your mind is rushing it's like wondering trying to find a solution okay what am i doing and then but after a while you just start noticing okay there's no solution right now there's just <laughs> you're just being flushed through a river and basically because of the intensity of the experience and the not having any choice then the mind uh, got rid of all distractions, basically. That's what happened. <laughs> Unfortunately, this was not through wisdom. <laughs> this was not through joy and letting go. This was just like, <laughs> okay, this is your life going by. And, um, but it still relatively in the same way happened that... Um, my mind was completely cleared of anything, basically. My, my mind was wiped off, wiped clean from any kind of thinking, any kind of, you know, uh, trying to find a solution or anything. And then it became really like very still, very, um, I would like to say 
collected, but unfortunately here, please bear with me, this is not through this beautiful practice that you've been doing. It's, uh, it's, it was forced upon me, which uh, really felt a lot like uh, some of these um, sweat lodge ceremonies that I, uh, I used to do in the past, where it's a bit like the same thing. The heat is so much that just even thinking is is uh, painful actually and you need to l get rid of thinking let it go and your mind becomes very very clear the thing is that again these these things they don't they do not necessarily come through wisdom they come they are put upon you to basically clear that slate but then afterwards it's hard to tap back into these states uh, but here we are learning how to get there with discernment, with uh, wise practice, and which you can apply anytime. And so this, this experience was really interesting because um, through this complete letting go and uh, noticing how, how this experience was just happening uh, even through me, and my mind was just very clear uh, until it started to really fade, fade away, basically, uh, as I was kind of fainting, basically. Um, but all I could feel was sensations, body, and just flowing through, flowing through, flowing through. And there was not strength or there was not any inclination in the mind to any, put any label on it. There was, no, there was no labeling, there was no conceptualization of anything. There was just this feeling, sensations, the body, and then the mind that was just very still and clear because it couldn't do anything else, basically. And that was a really interesting meditation on impermanence. <laughs> um, I do not recommend it, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> Please don't do so. But I thought I would at least share my experience and um, hopefully this can be just an interesting introduction to uh, what we're going to see tonight. Um, because the Buddha uh, told the monks, monks cultivate mental collectedness. Collected in mind, monks, one understands things the way they truly are. And this is where we go from, okay, now we're practicing samatha. Yes? <laughs> How did I get out the river? Well, <laughs> um, so basically um, what happened was I, at that point, I couldn't move, you know, I, there was no strength in my body at all. I just, I, um, so I, I floated up the river, basically, I, I floated up, because the, I basically spent the whole section under the water, except the one time I came up, and, uh, and it was like, I don't know, like three, four kilometers of, of canyon. And uh, when I came up, basically my, my life jacket basically just kind of brought me slowly back up because it was quite small and I'm a big person. So <laughs> it wasn't a really, it's the reason why I went down and I didn't get stuck in the, in the thing. But in, the, in another way, I was kind of like slow to come up. <laughs> <laughs> and fortunately enough, my friend who was the raft guide on that river was um, just paddled through the whole canyon, like nonstop, just trying to get me, basically. And uh, there was two of my friends. And at some point, I just, <laughs> just emerged <laughs> up. And uh, I felt like the river was getting uh, shallow as well. Like uh, the, the section was over. Because the canyons are, usually, canyons are usually much deeper, because they're clear cut and they go deep. 
but then it, it opened up again and then it was like riverbanks and uh, it was much more shallow and actually my knees were just scraping the, the bottom <laughs> but I couldn't lift myself up like there was no way like I could barely like lift my head above the water and I started to breathe again my friend came with the, his, on his kayak and uh, he, he said like uh, <laughs> what did he say like grab me grab me and I'm like I can't like, I can't like <laughs> I, mean, I see you but I can't grab you <laughs> like and so he just like grabbed both my arms and he put like my arms on his waist basically and so he just like paddled me to the shore or where it was just like obviously shallow enough that I could like at least just like lay there <laughs> and um, it took me a good 20 minutes to I was really like this close I was almost gone like almost like <laughs> it was so close Did you have any broken no no no, I didn't hit anything. I was really lucky and yeah, 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 like really lucky. Yeah, I easily could have died, like really easily. And uh, yeah, I was this close to fainting and fainting in, in water, you know, it's not, it's not good. So, especially in a moving body of water. Uh, yeah, I really... Um, I, I, I really thought I was going to die there, that's for sure. Like, I, I was, like, I kind of said, like, okay, like, this is it, bye. <laughs> but uh, I, I came out, so, so this is how the story ends. And uh, I thought of my family. That's the first thing that I thought, how much I love them. So that's, that was it. Yes? Did you ever go back? <laughs> go back. <laughs> Uh, where? <laughs> uh, canoeing. Yes, yes, yes. That uh, same can No, no, no. No, no. <laughs> no, I never, <laughs> never tried that one again. But I did go back canoeing. Yes, yes. Now. Yeah. Hmm? Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, I learned from my lesson. Um, I think that's how you get wiser. <laughs> that's what they say, anyways. <laughs> Yes, coming out of the stream. <laughs> yes, of Samsara. Yeah. It took me a little bit more, but <laughs> you know <laughs> I wasn't very wise, I guess. <laughs> I needed some more experiences. But yeah, yeah. Uh yeah, I definitely uh, die almost died a few times in my life. Uh unfortunately. Uh another one was rock climbing and uh yeah few times ice climbing for sure but yeah <laughs> oops uh, but yeah I think I think I'm doing better now and uh, <laughs> I hear there's rafting though here on the Tista River <laughs> yeah maybe we could uh, go for a trip after the retreat yeah, <laughs> yeah. so Maybe I'll, I'll loop around after, after the discourse and uh, tie, tie into that experience again after like, um, turning it into a wholesome Buddhist story. But <laughs> um, because it's, uh, it's definitely something that stuck with me, obviously. These, these events, they kind of mark you. So um, I, it, it, it comes up uh, every once in a while in my life to... Uh, in my practice of letting go. Somebody was asking about, do you have a practice to let go today? And, uh, oh, yes, yes. Uh, well, that, that's one of them. That's one of mine. <laughs> I just remember that. <laughs> so, so I've been talking about how to six R's, how to bring up the love, the loving kindness, the smiling, how that uplifts the mind into collectedness, and it calms down, calms the mind down, and it becomes very steady. And how the mind through that enters levels of meditation. And this is samadhi, and this is also known as samatha. 
and this is required and the other fold that is required also because these two samatha and vipassana they come together they work together and we need to um, bring them together so that they're complete and they help each other they're like uh, two uh, two buddies <laughs> Two teammates, they, they help each other. If one is not doing well, the other one pulls up the other one. And, and then they help each other like that. But then, um, and this is a sutta that I really like, a discourse where uh, the Buddha says, okay, so, but what, what do we do with this? What do we do with this samadhi? What do we do with this collectedness of mind that happens through wisdom, letting go of the hindrances? And naturally, the mind becomes collected with joy and letting go. So collected in mind, one understands the way things truly are. What are the things one understands as they truly are? And today we talked a little bit about the five aggregates with some people in interviews. Um, the five fabrics of the egos, I like to call them. And this is what we're talking about here. Such is body, such is its arising, such its passing away. Such are experiences, such their arising, such their passing away. Such are perceptions, such their arising, such their passing away. Such are mental activities, such their arising, and such their passing away. Such is consciousness, such is its arising, such its passing away. So, do you see already how samadhi is like this clear, collected, calm stillness? And when the mind is like this, everything that happens around is seen as impermanent or just flowing by, just flowing by us. Because the mind that is collected that is samadhi <laughs> is not clinging, it's not latching on to the river of experience and it's seeing things for what they are. It's arising and it's passing away, arising and passing away. And this doubles up the letting go process. It really helps us to let go even deeper as the mind becomes collected. It's like this island coming out of the ground in the middle of the flood, basically, which is kind of like safe ground, a safe shore that the Buddha talks about. It's still, and then the, we can see the movement, the river, the, the water go flowing all around it. And what monks is the arising of body? And here, for the purpose of this sutta, uh, because I really also like to implement the six senses and the body is also here the six senses and for you who know already dependent origination you know that uh, lack of discernment supports uh, mental activities mental activities or sankara mental activities support consciousness consciousness supports nama rupa and rupa is body here this is what I'm talking about. And then Nama Rupa supports Salayatana, the six senses. So Rupa and Salayatana, the six senses and the body is very close. So I will change the word body here for the six senses. Because this is important for us because this is how distractions affect our mind through the six senses. That's how they come in. And then there's these experiences, sensations, uh, perceptions, and then mental activities based upon those, and then the consciousness that is arising out of all of this. <laughs> you guys follow me? <laughs> this is a little bit more brainy tonight. <laughs> yes, no. A clear collectedness of mind that comes through wisdom is not indifference. So there is a, there is a really big, um, a very important difference between uh, like the upekka, basically, that comes from indifference, like the mental, uh, the equanimity 
that comes from indifference and the equanimity that comes from wisdom and mental development. Yeah. And the Buddha actually pointed that out many times, you know, and uh, develop the, the upekka, develop the equanimity that is based upon wholesome states, not based upon indifference. That is aware, not that is just not caring and vegetative, like you said, that's great. <laughs> yes, great, great remark. Is that addressing? No, yeah, yeah? Somewhere. Okay. Question, like... Okay. My, I, I really loved how Bhante Vimala Ramsey, my teacher, would always say, the hindrances, the distractions that arise in your mind, they are your teachers. They are showing you, basically, what's in your mind. They're, they don't happen for no reason, you know. It's just like I said yesterday in the talk, um, whatever one frequently thinks and reflects upon, that's what's going to arise for them in their minds. So when, uh, for example, there's a lot of... Uh, and we see that on retreat right away, between, in the first few days. All our distractions, you know, like uh, the TV, the Netflix, who said talk about Netflix the other day? <laughs> that was great. Yes. So, you know, like the Netflix is taken away, the, all the things that you could do to distract your mind is taken away, and now, boom, you have nothing. <laughs> and then, like, whatever you've been doing with your mind, that's what's going to come up. And so that's teaching you. And it's, this is an opportunity for you to see with wisdom, with discernment. Okay, so this is how the mind is. This is how it's behaving. Okay, and now what about, okay, so is this, is this pleasant? Is, this comes with tension. You can feel it. And then, okay, what about if, I'm about to, if I can let that go and release that, relax? And right there, there's relief. There's the relief because the mind, when it's really agitated, when it's distracted, when it's anxious, and when it's experiencing all these states, it's not really happy, actually. It's, uh, and that's why we cultivate joy. Every time a hindrance arises in the mind, look how your mind is. It's not going to be happy. That's like the dead giveaway. It's like the, the smile is gone. It's not really happy. It's thinking. It's becoming serious. And then it's, uh, it's feeding that loop, basically. And what we're trying to do here is to turn that around, basically. To uh, 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 change the algorithm in the mind to a wholesome one, which will be productive, which will be uh, helping us in the long run be beneficial. So this is where we're trying to, to go. <laughs> But the hindrances, they're not to be pushed away, they're not to be ignored, they're actually teaching you, they're teaching us what, what is actually happening with our minds. So. And what is the arising of the six senses? What is the arising of experiences or sensations? The arising of perception, the arising of mental activities, and the arising of consciousness. So how do these things arise? How do they come up? And how do they stay most, most importantly? Here one is overjoyed, holds dear, and remains attached. And this, in this particular sutta, it's uh, talking about holding on, but it also can be pushing away. Pushing away is another form of holding on. <laughs> But it's holding on to not this. <laughs> so it's, um, there is tension in it. It's um, basically, dislike is still wanting something. It's wanting this thing not to be, basically. That's what it is. So it's the same thing, but it's just a little bit different. There's a little tweak in it. So when we don't like something, we still are looking for something that is not existing here and now, basically. Here, one is overjoyed, holds dear, and remains attached to the six senses. By doing so, fondness arises. With such fondness for the six senses, there is attachment. Okay, so again here, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't like anything in life. Okay, let's clear that out. This is not nihilism. <laughs> this is simply to help us understand uh, when something arises 
at, the, at any of our sense door. And for example, um, somebody that you find uh, really attractive, that you really like because it's talking about fondness. So I just kind of want to stay with the, the thing. And, um, and then you're seeing them. And what happens is that there's the, oh, there's the one thing, there's the clinging happening. And uh, through that, the mind will uh, basically remain attached to that. And this is how it's arising, basically. This is how it's arising and it's going to stay there. It's going to stay in the mind because we're holding on to it. But uh, to see this whole process is to see how this arises and how we can actually let it go. Because these hindrances, they are all things that we, in the past, held on to. Whether it was like, I, I, I don't like it, <laughs> or I really like it, I want to keep it. But in both ways, we're keeping it, we're, we're clinging to it. So, um, and how, how this process works, how it arises, and how we remain attached to it. And this is why it's arising in the meditation, because later, we haven't really given it up. So it, it arises again, basically. That's how it works. Attachment produces a sense of beingness. And so this sense of who we are, uh, I'll just touch lightly upon this, but is nothing but a package, a bundle of our attachments, basically. Uh, when we were young, uh, for example, my dad was eating chips and not popcorn. That's an example. It's not real. Um, so I grew up, my dad was eating chips and I was eating chips because my dad did. And so I thought, I'm a chips kind of guy. <laughs> and then some of my friends were like, it was the popcorn. And then uh, they were like, no, like popcorn is so much better. Like, this is me. Like, I like popcorn. Like, I'm a popcorn guy. And no, what are you talking about? I'm like, chips are much better. <laughs> so, so it's this thing. But what is that? That's just an attachment. It, it's not really real. It's just because it causes and conditions in your life. Your, your dad was a chip eater. <laughs> and, then, and then you got to eat chips and then that's who you thought you were. That's what you thought you liked. And just because that's all you had. And then maybe uh, when you tasted your friend's popcorn, then you thought, oh, well, I'm a chips and a popcorn kind of person. So I'm kind of both. I'm, I'm okay with both. And so this is how it arises. <laughs> so this is the sense of beingness to keep it light. It's just really this. Uh, and this is like, it works for chips, it works for popcorn, but it also works, you know, like, a, oh, I went to this university, I studied, like, I'm an electrician, um, I'm this, I am that, I'm a raft guide, or I'm a monk. <laughs> hopefully, <laughs> hopefully, if you're a monk, you understand that being a monk is about letting go of all that, but <laughs> unfortunately, it doesn't always happen. Um, I try, I try my, I'm trying my best. <laughs> and that sense of beingness culminates into taking action, the birth of karma, basically. We're going to think about that. We're going to think this is me, this is who I am, this is mine. Uh, and then we're going to propagate thoughts, proliferate thoughts upon that and take action upon these thoughts as well. And this, this brings us tension. This, this is basically the birth, how distractions arise, basically. And because this gains momentum, and when we slow everything down, we come on retreat, this is what arises. And that's normal, that's okay. And this is what the process we've been doing. We've been cleansing the mind through joy, uplifting the mind, cleansing it through love, and then learning to wisely recognize that, seeing the tension, and then releasing, relaxing that. So this is the, the process. And this happens at, at each of the sense doors, whether it's the eyes, seeing someone, whether that you like them or you don't like them, uh, uh, sounds, whether you're hearing sounds that you like or the hearing sounds that you don't like, whether it's uh, tasting, whether you're, you like the food or you don't like the food that you're eating here, hopefully you like it. 
but uh, <laughs> uh, then it's not causing too much distractions. Uh, it's, it's cold here, it's colder climate, uh, so maybe for you it's a, a touch, bodily touch. So all of these things, uh, uh, is it pleasant or unpleasant and what do we do with it? Are we clinging to it or pushing it away or are we free from it? Are we letting it go, relaxing? And the mind is, remains free and happy and un, unshaken by these things, but uh, not indifferent. So, one is overjoyed, holds dear, and remains attached to experiences, sensations. By doing so, and this can also be, uh, uh, is not overjoyed, <laughs> or like a, is uh, averse, or uh, pushing these things away, pushing these experiences away. In both, in both ways, we're clinging, we're holding them there. By doing so, fondness arises. With such fondness for experiences, there is an attachment. So, through the six senses, through contact, and through also experience, all the experiences that we're uh, feeling, attachments produce a sense of beingness. Then we attach to that as, this is me, this is who I am, this is mine. That sense of beingness culminates into the creation of more karma, propagation, thinking with the mind. And this creates distractions and tension. When you'll read this sutta, if, if, you, if you do after uh, you'll read the, this translation, you'll notice it's quite different. I'm adapting because uh, there are two ways that we can understand dependent origination. One is through like a rebirth and, you know, like a... Um, a quite much more uh, elaborated process of uh, karmic uh, momentum through many lifetimes. But here I'm keeping it really uh, simple, boiled down to our practice so that we can use it here and now. So I don't want to get lost into philosophies too much tonight. One is overjoyed and holds dear and remains attached to perceptions. By doing so, fondness arise. With this fondness for perceptions, there is attachment. Attachments produce a sense of beingness. This is me, this is who I am, this is mine. That sense of beingness culminates into uh, taking action, the birth of karma, basically. Uh, propagating with the mind, thinking, thinking about it, and creating more disturbances which come with tension. And it's the same thing for mental activities. All these mental activities that are in the mind, we hold on to them as this is me, this is who I am, this is mine. And then we, we, uh, we hold on to them and we think that certain mental activities are, uh, uh, are ours and we propagate them, we, we uh, make more of them. And it's the same thing for consciousness. This is the arising of the six senses, the arising of experiences, the arising of perceptions, the arising of mental activities, the arising of consciousness. And so this is how it arises and this is how basically in, an, in, in other terms, this is how we keep it there, basically. This is how it stays there and this is how it stays as distractions. What is the passing away of the six senses, of experiences, perceptions, mental activities, and consciousness? Here, one is not overjoyed, does not hold dear, and remains attached. Basically, what would that be? That's a question. <laughs> Equanim yes, equanimity. But the equanimity that happens through wisdom, how do we get there? There's six of them. Yes, <laughs> very good. <laughs> this is a bit of a giveaway. <laughs> good, yes, very good. So basically, if we just read this without knowing right effort, then it could sound nihilistic. It's like, yeah, you just want to be like a vegetable. <laughs> just like 
looking at life like it's lifeless, basically. There's nothing to do, there's nothing to be done. And for a long time also I thought Buddhism was kind of like that. It felt really pessimistic to me in many ways. And um, until I encountered my teacher now, Bhante Vimaramsi, and uh, I understood a lot more about wholesome mental development and how it works and how this samadhi works as well. And how to... Um, use this right effort to bring this beautiful collectedness of mind which brings about discernment and then we can understand what the Buddha is saying here as not being pessimistic it's just what happens when the mind is uh, collected through wisdom but the thing is that we need some we need some background to understand this that's the that's the problem and uh, a lot of the times People that try to interpret that do not have the required background to understand this properly. So then it sounds pessimistic. Uh. Yeah, I feel like one way to phrase it, kind of oversimplified, is that you're taking things less seriously. Uh, you know, which fits with this practice because if the mind really fixates on something, then it's taking it so seriously and it starts to starts this whole tree of like conceptualization and the whole chain of suffering but if it's just taking things as they are without making it such a big deal then it's kind of like your uh your river analogy where you're just you're just going with the river and you're not getting hit by rocks constantly and getting stuck on things you're just kind of flowing so i feel like that that framing of it that you're just kind of flowing with life and it's so much easier as opposed to uh, somehow like going through life like a zombie, very detached from everything. Uh, if you're flowing with life, then things are like more vivid and more real and there's more, you're more in touch with uh, actual experience because um, experience is what happens before all of that conceptualization. Yes, good, well said. <laughs> The Venerable Ananda was delighted and uplifted by Venerable Metananda's words. <laughs> Monk jokes. <laughs> Very good. Um, don't worry, I'm not going to start stand-up comedy. <laughs> yes, yes, I'll let that to you. <laughs> Very good. So, through wisdom, we understand the right way of doing this. Yes, Samir. I mean, there are 50,000 shades of gray. <laughs> uh, if we're going <laughs> to. Yeah. Uh, 84,000, yeah, if we were stick closer to the Buddhas. <laughs> 84,000. I mean, yeah, like, I mean, where does equanimity that is based on the higher mind, the atichitta and wholesome mental development, where does it fade into, like, a, at some point, maybe some kind of indifference because it loses its wholesome base? Where does it start to be, like, tolerance? Um, where can someone start to understand, okay, this is just because it's unple unpleasant. Now, I'm, uh, the, the tolerance is, like, I'm... I'm I'm seeing this experience as unpleasant and therefore like there's a kind of a taking it personal but if if I can just remain as like hmm this is just this experience basically and not conceptualize on it there is a space where it it actually can and like you won't know <laughs> if that person is in a wholesome kind of equanimity or is just indifferent or if it's just tolerating you. <laughs> There's no way you're going to tell. Like it's, it's so, it looks the same. So basically when, when the six senses arise or when, when somebody, uh, when a contact arise, when the six senses arise, then when one uh, sees that for what it is, it's just the six senses, or it's just sound, it's just visual contact, or it's just cold touching my skin. And then there's no more layers added on top of that, or I like this, I don't like this, uh, this is me, this is who I am, this is usually, uh, uh, this is, this is usually how I react. 
then the hindrances, they, they don't have any power to arise or they don't have the, the strength uh, because you have the wisdom to see it before it starts or you, you understand how the mind works, basically. And so when one is not overjoyed and does not hold the ear and remains attached to the six senses, by doing so, fa fondness does fondness ceases. So there's a moving away, basically. It doesn't stay. Uh, it, it, it's like um, these uh, film strips or these, uh, these picture uh, projectors, these old ones, like the Kodak or whatever. Like you just press a button and you have a new picture. And it's like, that's like the holding on. But if you're, uh, if you're just like uh, not holding on to that, it's just going to, okay, then it's going to change again. And it's going to pass, it's going to pass, it's going to pass. So something arises, but we're not holding on to it. So it goes on and passes. Is, is that a raised hand? No, okay. What's fondness? Fondness is like uh, liking it. Basically, I think it's a sata, sata, nandi, nandi, mm. nandi. Yeah, one delights. Uh, there's there's delight um, in that. And this is what creates attachment. Is the yes, yes. So basically, it's, it's basically saying like not finding the light in any of these things, but finding the light inside, basically, in, in the higher mind, which whatever then, when you have that, whatever you're going to do is going to be fun. That's what, basically, that's what it means. But when we cling on to things or push away things in, in our environment and our experience, then then we're actually creating friction in the flow of our life, basically. So we're not allowing it to flow. I'm sorry, you said the light and the like inside. Light. Delight. 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 Yes, the, the light. Yes, that's, that's my French accent. <laughs> the light. <laughs> yes. Okay. When fondness for the six senses sees, attachment sees. So basically, as, as soon as we let that go, it all stops, basically. We're not, we're not even holding on to it. When attachment sees, the sense of beingness ceases. When we don't have attachments that we're accumulating, adding up, then there's no sense of, I like chips or I like popcorn. It's just, it's just chips. It's just popcorn. <laughs> It's great, either way. I have a question. Yes. So basically, um, there is bhavatanha and yes. there is vibhavatanha. So there is the difference between, okay, so yeah, maybe you don't want to become something anymore, but you also don't necessarily want to die. Yes. Like, like, it's not because you're an arahant that you want pain, basically. And like, you're still smart enough to like, not put your hand in the fire or something, you know. So basically, that's, that's the same thing for food. It's like, well, this body needs food. And that's it. It's just for sustaining the body until it's, it runs its course naturally. And then it, whenever it, uh, the body breaks and then life ends and the ayu sankara is basically the, the vital formations. Basically, everything that happens in your body, there's so many things that happen in our body that it's not, not under our control, which we'll dive into soon. But like the heart beating, you know, the, the, the blood moving, all of this, like, I'm not, I, I'm not doing this. Like, this is just happening. So that's for, for the layperson, that is Bhavastana still. So. Uh, basically, uh, w if there's no more attachments, uh, there is, um, it doesn't, it, they will accept whatever food they have. They, they, won't, they won't be able to get a job or whatever. Like, yeah. it's, not, it's too much. Yes, it's, too <laughs> it's a little bit too much Bhavatana. But, uh, <laughs> so that, that, that person has to become a monk, is that right? 
Yes, technically. Or live very closely like a monk. Yeah. Uh, that's the only way that I can see this happening. Yeah. Because, I mean, otherwise if you fall into the whole game again, then that there, there needs to be, uh, there needs to be, you know, this, this, uh, this pull towards projecting in the future, basically. But when there's not that... Uh, yeah, basically, yeah. Like accumulating things, like looking for safety, and then, yeah, all this, this game starts again. Yeah. <laughs> it was uh, today, it was like uh, paying bills. <laughs> we talked about paying bills. I was like, yeah, that's going to catch you, like, right up till the end. <laughs> so that was a good one. Okay, so obviously, uh, so when there's the sense of beingness, the sense of I, that, that comes through attachments. When there's no attachments arising, this sense of beingness doesn't arise. And this is also a gradual thing that you can see as mental development builds. The mind becomes really clear. This samadhi, um, I like to say that samadhi is just like selflessness. You know, the, the, Buddha, the Buddha talked about the jhanas as temporary liberations. So this is really interesting. What we're all practicing here on this retreat is gradually training your mind to be liberated. It's not, it's not that different when the mind is collected and it's pure and it's bright, it's uplifted and it's clear. It's very close to liberation. It's very close to that state which the Buddha realized. And samadhi, samadhi doesn't have attachments in it. When, when there's attachment, there's no samadhi. It's like flowing out into the world, basically, thinking about this, thinking about that. But when all of that is let go of through wisdom, then the mind gets collected naturally. It just kind of like, it just comes in because it has nowhere else to go. You've let go of everything else with wisdom and cultivated wholesome states. When the mind is joyful, it's not looking for joy outside, it's, it's got it. <laughs> so it, it's not looking outside anymore. And this samadhi, uh, there's very little, little, very little sense of self in it because it's just there, it's just happy. It's not, it's not selfing, and that's a, that's a popular word these days that has come up in Buddhism especially, is this notion of selfing. Selfing everything, basically. And the mind that is in samadhi is not a selfing mind, basically. It has let go of all the causes and conditions for that. When that sense of beingness ceases, then there's no taking action, mental action. There's no thinking. There's no proliferating about these things. It just cuts it at the root. And so this is the blueprint of the mind, the blueprint of liberation. And of course, it's the same thing for feelings, experiences, perceptions, uh, mental activities, sankharas, and consciousness. So it's the same process for each of them. I'm not going to go into that uh, right now because I'd like to um, flow into uh, the features of selflessness, the anatta lakana sutta, which is the characteristics of non-self. Um, I like, I would like to offer this as an exercise tonight. Uh, I personally really enjoy this, this course as a guided meditation. And so remembering that um, one thing I, I, I guess I would like to say before I, I get into this and we, we wrap up this talk. Um, whenever a distraction arises in your mind, okay, uh, you're, with, with, you're with your spiritual friend or you're with your object of meditation, your vehicle of awareness, and it's stable, it's there, and then at some point this distraction arises. Did you call it up? Was that you? <laughs> Did you say, oh, I haven't been distracted in a really long time. <laughs> I should do it now. <laughs> no, that's just not the way it works. Can you tell your mind right now, okay, I'm going to enter Naroda Samapati. I'm going to enter Nibbana, here and now. Boom. That's a dream. 
That's a dream, yes. I, I wish. Yeah, right? Huh? No, you can't because that's not how it works. <laughs> See, these things are happening. They've been built up within us and we need to learn to how to calm them down, how to let them go. And this is the way that we get there. It's not just by... Um, not just wishing for it, but also this, this process is completely conditioned. It is brought up by conditions that we have built up upon lifetimes. And now this momentum is continuing. And these distractions that are arising, they're just basically a bouncing. <laughs> they're kind of echo, like you shouted in a canyon and then you didn't hear your your scream for, I don't know, like one minute. But then it's coming back at you because that's how it works. <laughs> it's like the echo of the mind, basically. So that's how distractions work. And this is an impersonal process. It's not to be taken seriously. When distractions arise in your mind, it's not you. You, ha you, didn't, you didn't ask for that to come up. You didn't say like, oh, I haven't felt anxious in a long time. That would be great to feel it now. That's... No, it's just not the way it works. It's just the mind, how we've trained it in the past. And now when you stop doing everything, it arises. And that's normal. And this is our opportunity to change that, to rewire the mind. And so slowly, slowly understanding how impersonal this process is. And so you can be okay with it. It's fine. The mind is distracted, okay mind, that's how it's going to be. Calm down, smile, laugh at the mind. Like Venerable was saying, a really good way of saying this is don't take it so seriously. Because it's not. It's not that serious. It's not even you. <laughs> Just causes and conditions. So, upon this, uh, please take a comfortable position. It should take maybe 10, 15 minutes. So just for your information, this is the second discourse that the Buddha gave uh, after his awakening. The first one is the Dhamma Chakkapavattana Sutta, the turning of the wheel of Dhamma. And the second one uh, is the features of selflessness, the Anattalakana Sutta. And this is where uh, basically the five ascetics that were with him uh, attained arahanship and this is a very uh, very very uh, core sutta and understanding on the buddha's awakening basically what he understood so here it is at one time the awakened one was residing at varanasi in deer park at izipatana then he addressed the group of five monks thus, Monks, Badante, they replied. The Awakened One said this, Monks, the six senses are not self. For if the six senses were self, this, these six senses would never come upon any unpleasant experience. And one could decide, let my six senses be like this, let my six senses be like that. But these six senses are not self. Because these six senses do come upon unpleasant experiences. And one cannot decide, let my six senses be like this, let my six senses be like that. Sensations are not self. For if sensations would be self, these sensations would never come upon hurt. And one could decide, let my sensations be like this, let my sensations be like that. But sensations are not self. Because sensations do come upon hurt. And one cannot decide, let my sensations be like this, let my sensations be like that. Perceptions are not self. 
For if these perceptions would be self, these perceptions would never come upon hurt. And one could decide, let my perceptions be like this, let my perceptions be like that. But perceptions are not self, because these perceptions do come upon hurt. And one cannot decide, let my perceptions be like this, let my perceptions be like that. Mental activities are not self. For if mental activities would be self, these mental activities would never come upon hurt. And one could decide, let my mental activities be like this, let my mental activities be like that. But mental activities are not self. Because mental activities do come upon hurt. And one cannot decide, let my thoughts, let my mental activities be like this, let my mental activities be like that. Consciousness is not self, for if this consciousness would be self, this consciousness would never come upon any hurt. And one could decide, let my consciousness be like this, let my consciousness be like that. But this consciousness is not self, because this consciousness does come upon hurt, and one cannot decide, let my consciousness be like this, let my consciousness be like that. What do you think? Are the six senses changing or unchanging? They are changing, Bhante. And that which is constantly changing. Is that pleasant or unpleasant? It is unpleasant, Bhante. That which is constantly changing, unpleasant and fleeting in nature. Is it sound to consider it as, this is me, this is who I am, this is myself? No, it is not, Bhante. Our sensations changing or unchanging. They are changing, Bhante. And that which is constantly changing, is that pleasant or unpleasant? It is unpleasant, Bhante. That which is constantly changing, unpleasant and of a fleeting nature, is it sound to consider it as, this is me, this is who I am, this is myself. No, it is not, Bhante. Are perceptions changing or unchanging? They are changing, Bhante. And that which is constantly changing, is that pleasant or unpleasant? It is unpleasant, Bhante. That which is constantly changing, unpleasant and of a fleeting nature, is it sound to consider it as, this is me? This is who I am. This is myself. No Bhante. Are mental activities changing or unchanging? They are changing, Bhante. And that which is constantly changing, is that pleasant or unpleasant? It is unpleasant, Bhante. That which is constantly changing, unpleasant and of a fleeting nature, is it sound to consider it as, this is me, this is who I am, this is myself? No, it is not, Bhante. Is consciousness changing or unchanging? It is changing, Bhante. And that which is constantly changing, is that pleasant or unpleasant? It is unpleasant, Bhante troublesome. That which is constantly changing, troublesome and of a fleeting nature, is it sound to consider it as, this is me, this is who I am, this is myself? No, it is not, Bhante. Now in this case, 
any kind of any of the six senses, whether past, present, or future, within or without, gross or subtle, low or high, far or near, all senses should be seen with wise discernment in this way. This is not me. This is not who I am. This is not myself. Any kind of sensations, whether past, present, or future, within or without, gross or subtle, low or high, far or near, all sensations should be seen with wise discernment in this way. This is not me. This is not who I am. This is not myself. Any kind of perceptions, whether past, present, or future, within or without, gross or subtle, low or high, far or near, all concepts should be seen with wise discernment in this way. This is not me. This is not who I am. And this is not myself. Any kind of mental activities, whether past, present, or future, within or without, gross or subtle, low or high, far or near, all mental activities should be seen with wise discernment in this way. This is not me. This is not who I am. This is not myself. Any kind of consciousness, whether past, present, or future, within or without, gross or subtle, low or high, far or near, all consciousness should be seen with wise discernment in this way. This is not me. This is not who I am. This is not myself. Now breaking free. Seeing in this way, monks, a wise meditator completely lets go of the six senses, completely lets go of sensations, completely lets go of perceptions, completely lets go of mental activities, completely lets go of consciousness. Because of complete letting go comes not holding. Because of not holding comes release. In this release, one knows this is release. There is no more unwholesome states. Lived is the holy life. Done is what had to be done. There is no more conceit here. This is what the Awakened One said. Glad at heart, the group of five monks rejoiced in these words. And while this discourse was being spoken, the group of five monks, by not holding, their minds became released from all mental distractions. Sigh. So how does your mind feel now? Yeah, that's why I translated it as constantly changing instead of impermanent, mm -hmm. because I like that recollection also. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's just a way to <coughs> basically develop this understanding that is not holding on to any of these things. It's not nihilistic. Um, and I actually wanted to bring that up uh, by myself in this talk. It's actually liberating. Uh, there is still a gradual path, a gradual training that brings us there slowly, slowly. And at the time of the Buddha, in the sasana, many monks heard this discourse many, many, many times over and over again. And it's not 
about you know pessimism or anything it's just how to train to see the mind not taking things so personally and how to be free from that because when we take things personally our mind is is hard our mind is not uplifted we're not happy but when our mind is not clinging to any of these things not becoming agitated we remain free we're able to carry what we've gradually accumulated with our practice even further into our life, so unimpeded. I hope this helped a little bit. <laughs> Very good. And um, I just thought I would end with a quote from uh, Muji, in fact, <sighs> which is not really a uh, necessarily fully Buddhist, but I, I, I liked it. And I like to bring whatever I can find that is compatible with uh, what we teach and practice, even if it comes from other teachers. So I'll have to get closer because this is really small. <laughs> I am never talking about tomorrow, yesterday, or even today. I am pointing only at the timeless now. Here there is not the concept or anticipation of next. Only the full awareness of being and presence. No intention, no investment here. None needed. If there appear any plans, they are only sketches. And all sketches are made of pencil. Everything erasable, everything changeable, and yet one's being is neither fickle nor flimsy. Here there is a strength, but also a lightness. There is power, but also softness. There is firmness, but also flexibility. The being is like solid emptiness immeasurable, weightless, yet more solid than a mountain, lighter than space, full yet empty, sublime. So I wish you a beautiful evening, happy meditation, and I will see you tomorrow.